Hello and welcome to the North American Guitar here in Fulham, London. And for this edition of Talking Guitar, I'm joined once again by my dear friend, Professor John Thomas of Quinnipiac University in Connecticut. Now, um, aside from being a world authority in uh, CITES and Brazilian Rosewood and all sorts of other stuff like that, um, which you can see in another video, John also wrote this book, Kalamazoo Gals, that you may have seen um, quite a lot of buzz online about. So, John, Kalamazoo Girls, what's happening here? Um, it's a story of a photograph that changed my life. So I was working, uh, doing some sort of freelance writing project for a music magazine. I can't remember which magazine, but hopefully my favorite, which is Fretboard Journal. It's a very good And one. I came across this photograph, and it just looked strange to me. So it's a photograph of some 70 women or so. Mm -hmm. in front of the Gibson factory. Looked like mid-1940s or so. I learned later that it was a June 1944 photograph. And it kind of haunted me. I just couldn't figure out why there were only women in front of this building. And as I was working on other projects, I would now and then come across a scrap of information about Gibson during World War II. Uh, that fabulous flat top book by Dan Erlewine and others mm. published in the mid 80s uh, had a line in it that said Gibson only built the very few guitars in World War II but they were among its finest because only the seasoned craftsmen stayed back yes. from the war and okay. the young guys went off to fight the war and the seasoned guys were the better luthiers and made better guitars it made these, perfect sense these were the banner Gibson these are banners so these I'm holding one of these so during World War II um, their guitars had this little golden banner that said only a Gibson is good enough <laughs> Gibson was the champion of exaggeration before and after the war. Every guitar was more beautiful than a southern bell, sounded more sonorous than a babbling brook. But during the war, they were just good enough. Uh, so the story from, from the Earl of Wine book, Fabulous Flat Tops, made some sense because there were only a few men stayed back. The young guys off fighting the war. The, the young guys stand, old guys staying back more experienced. They built great guitars. Then I looked again at this photograph, and there weren't any men in this photograph. Well, maybe the old guys were just hiding back in the back. And then I went a little deeper, and I found a book written by a fellow named Julius Belson. Julius Belson was in-house company historian for Gibson up through, oh, probably about 1980, thereabouts. In the early 1970s, he published a book called Gibson's Story, in which he wrote that Gibson built no musical instruments during the war because they were involved in wartime contracts. And Gibson was involved in wartime contracts, building parts for airplanes and other equipment. They built the... Uh, wings for airplanes. They built the amphibious pontoons under the floating airplanes. Really? Um, at one point in time, the metal restrictions didn't allow for the use of internal truss rods on the guitars. Turned out the metal adjustable truss rod was the exact same size needed for a piece of metal for machine guns. So Gibson did that. And of course, <laughs> Gibson was early in electronics, had early on in the 30s, had amplifiers and electric guitars, large lap steels. So Gibson did radio and radar work and that sort of thing. Wow. And Julius Belson, in addition, in the 70s, having been the in-house company historian, he was the personnel director from the late 30s all the way up past World War II. So he was the guy in the plant hiring everybody. Mm. So if anybody hired these women, it was Julius Belson. So now I was kind of curious, right? Um, the in-house guy said they didn't build any guitars. Some people in, in the know, in the vintage guitar community, thought they built some, and they had this little golden marker on it. And it started me on a quest. The first thing I needed to find out was whether Gibson built any instruments during World War II. And that turned out to be a difficult thing. Gibson is not a publicly held corporation, privately held, these days owned by three individuals who purchased it in the mid-80s, moved the corporate headquarters from Kalamazoo, Michigan, down to Nashville, Tennessee. And I thought, well, I'd heard about these things called shipping ledgers. But, and they were really mythological. There were people, especially in the Les Paul community, in the 1959 Les Paul, the most valuable East American the U.S. built guitar ever made. Um, it was mythological that there was a list somewhere in handwritten form and shipping ledgers that uh, would still tell you how many were made and when they shipped and that sort of thing. So there were murmurs in the vintage community about this. And so I contacted Gibson and I worked oh, from customer service up to the top and was told each step of the way, one, we don't have any. And two, if we did, you couldn't see them because we're a privately held corporation. Okay. And I kept thinking about that and I was about just about to give up. I'd been at that probably for a year, maybe a little longer. Just every now and then I'd find another name and I'd email the person or phone up. So the key, I thought, would be to find out whether Gibson shipped instruments during the war. Again, right. the in-house historian, the person who hired everybody during the war, said we didn't make any instruments. It took me a while. Finally got a contact name, someone had referenced a person 
who said, I don't think we have any shipping ledgers. I emailed this person. He responded, I don't think we have any shipping ledgers, but I'll look. About 10 minutes later, I get an email response. I'm sitting here opening a page in an old dusty book, handwritten. It says, in this date, 1938, we shipped a guitar to Les Paul. We've got a stack of these. You can come down to Nashville anytime you want and see them. <laughs> so two days later, I was in Nashville. And um, my f good friend, Willie Henkes, mm -hmm. and Henkes Doesn't in Henkes. Germany, both great guitarists, joined me on this journey. Mm -hmm. Part-time, my sister came down uh, to uh, help me read all these ledgers. And I spent three days there. Um, Willie and I and my sister photographed 4,400 pages of these ledgers. The person at Gibson who invited me down, helped set up and arrange, helped, helped, helped us lay things out so we could photograph it. Clearly had permission to do this. Photographed all these shipping ledgers and counted it up. And again, Gibson said we didn't build any. Some people thought maybe they built a few. Gibson shipped almost 25,000 instruments during the war. 25,000? 25,000. 25, About 9,100 of which were banner flat tops. So in addition to a fun picture and a little bit of history, I got a mystery. Mm. And I'm a, a, by day, my day job is I teach law, which I like a lot, um, but not enough to do that full time. And I'm a, sort of a musician, not of this caliber, but I can you know, pick a tune or two. Um, but I also do freelance writing, and I really thrive on doing a variety of different things at one time. And I got something that had all the ingredients of things I love. It's got music, it's got history, and it's got some mystery. Mm -hmm. And actually social justice, because these women who built these instruments had never received their due, and I got to provide it. So I went on a journey. Um, I thought, well, now I know they made instruments. I can identify them because they've got that golden banner. And I decided I wanted to find one of the people in this photograph. June 1944, most of these women were just out of high school. Mm -hmm. A few of them were a little bit older. When I started this project, oh, about seven or eight years ago, six or eight years ago now, the book came out three years ago. And when I was, if I could reach them, I thought they'll be in their 80s or 90s. And the youngest one I met was, I think, then 82. The oldest was 97. I found 12 of the women in this photograph. Okay. You can't see it from this far away, but one of the women sitting, oh, fifth from the right in the camera, um, in the front row, her name's Jenny Snow, and she identified herself. First woman I talked to, she had a flower in her hair, and you could see that flower in her hair. <laughs> so I, I, it took me on this journey, and it took me really into... Um, the history of the country. It's really self-discovery and also the discovery of a nation's history. I felt like a marine biologist who found a new little species at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. It may be a small discovery, but it is a discovery, and it's a real privilege to find something that no one else knew about. No one else knew about this bit of history. My line has become, everybody knew about Rosie the Riveter. She's our sort of um, mantra <laughs> of women's help with the World War II, but nobody knew about her sister, Laura the Luthier. And I found Laura the Luthier. And so I found these women. They told me these tales. Uh, it led me into this incredible journey. Uh, I, because I could identify the instruments, I decided to do some sort of fake science, if you will. I started an x-ray project. Mm -hmm. I could x-ray and I, I work at a, I have a joint appointment at a law school and a medical school. I had access to high-tech, state-of-the-art. Where did you get those wonderful toys? <laughs> I know. So we had, had state-of-the-art digital x-ray and also <laughs> CT scans. Helpful. And so um, I called up the the folks who were in that department thinking they could laugh me out of the building. I said, I got kind of a funny proposition. What? I'd like to x-ray guitars. Oh, cool. <laughs> and you know, another thing is, and I'm Obviously, sure, yeah. oh, of course, why not? You, you, you know this probably as well or not better than anybody because not only do you have an international business here, but you travel to speak and perform at all these really major guitar gatherings around the globe. And you know that the guitar community is a really giving, caring community. Mm -hmm. And so I sent out emails to collectors of World War II or that, that roughly that era guitars that I wanted about a dozen pre-World War II cars, just pre-World War II, like late, 40, late 30s, very early 40s, a dozen or so World War II era guitars, and a dozen or so just after, like 46, 47, 1946, 1947, and people inundated me with guitars. And we did an x-ray study, and I could, and CT scanning was the coolest thing ever. Um, uh, we, we are the East Coast training facility, my university, Tosh uh, Quinnipiac, for Toshiba, has two training facilities in the U.S., one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, and we get the state-of-the-art thing, and I don't know anything about this stuff other than they make cool pictures of guitars, <laughs> but the, the, the CT scans, really, what they do is take a photograph, like an x-ray, mm. uh, every angle, like, a, I don't know, it's two or three per millimeter, it's unbelievable, wow. and they cut it every different way, and so you can actually reconstruct three-dimensional objects. You can slice the instrument anywhere you want. Mm -hmm. And so 
but also it measures density. So in a, on a CT scanner, usually a preset, so your physician can push a button to show your skeleton, muscle, skeleton skeleture, if you will. Uh, another button, just the muscles, another button for the nervous system, another button for the vascular system. So Toshiba built me presets. So I could push a button to show the bracing, I could push a button to show the innards of the neck, I could push a button to show the plates, and then I could bring up a three-dimensional image and spin it in front of me. So you, cool. you've got like a, a preset for the, for the maple Toblerone uh, running down I've the neck? everything. Oh, wow. Also with the x-rays, uh, I could measure everything to the one ten thousandth of a whatever you want. So every single plate, every single bit on the instrument, I could measure its thickness. So it turned out that the women's work during the war was slightly more refined than the men's work just before and after the war. That everything's a little thinner. Does it make it better? I don't know, but it makes it distinguishable, right? And, and we could argue about whether it's better, but it is different. Uh, and that was a mystery. I, when I found 12 of these women, about a quarter of them, three actually were building guitars, three or four built the strings, some did administrative work, that sort of thing. That probably was a fair sample, but I don't know. I wish I'd done this earlier. And I found a woman who, uh, who did a lot of different things on guitar. She did bracing, she um, did a lot of binding, but she also built bridges. And if you go back and read this Fabulous Flat Tops book, which I recommend, the folks who wrote Fabulous Flat Top did not have access to these shipping ledgers I had. So there are inaccuracies, not due to their errors, due to their lack of the information. They didn't get their lucky spot and find somebody to show them the ledgers. But there's a reference in there that says the World War II guitars, um, and they, these folks believe that there were a few made, there were lots made actually. World War II guitars are distinguishable by that golden banner, but also because the bridges are like particularly beautifully sculpted. Hmm. So I found out why. I found this woman, <laughs> and she was the woman who said, you know, this is, a, she did all these other, parts of guitar making. She says, one strange thing. I really liked making bridges because I liked the way the wood felt. I liked the way it smelled and I just couldn't stop sanding it. And um, I mean, they are really beautifully sculpted. Uh, you, you'll never find more beautifully sculpted bridges on a Gibson guitar than during the war. So it was a really interesting process and um, it opened up a world to me. I became a writer rather than just a law professor. Uh, it really again crossed boundaries. I got good coverage in feminist literature, history, History reviewers, the BBC did an hour-long yes. radio documentary narrated by Susie Quattro <laughs> of my generation. Susie Quattro was in a U.S. Uh, television show called Happy Days. Uh, she was a big star here, uh, particularly in the U.K. with her pop tunes, mm. rock and pop tunes. But um, I got a photograph of this, and this only really works with people of my generation. A young guy like Michael would understand this. <laughs> but she always wore leather pants. She was known as Leather Tuscadero in the Happy Days show. That was her uh, non plume. <laughs> And she still wore the leather pants. And I got to sit in the BBC studios. My thigh is almost touching her thigh in leather pants. I want to tell you, you know, not many people. I, that's, that's a little bragging. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it introduced me to the world. It, it, it's a story that resonates. I call it Kalamazoo Gals mm. because these women walked into the factory in January 1942. Uh, the, the U.S. was bombed in December uh, 7th, 1941 by the, the Japanese, which brought us into World War II. Be judgmental of why it took us so long to get into World War II, but it, we did come into World War II. So January 1942, the young men, all the men roughly had left the factory. The women walked in, and number one on the pop charts in U.S., Glenn Miller's version of I've Got a Gal in Kalamazoo. So I got a you know, title Kalamazoo Gals. Um, so yeah, it was a real pleasure. And you know, it's, I think this is how we met probably through this. Um, it's introduced me to a lot uh, of members of the guitar yeah. community. Um, Cause you, were, you were at Healdsburg. Uh, when we first met face to face, but the uh, I think before that there was all sorts of uh, internet commentary on uh, on ancient guitars and uh, L L O's, L ones, all this sort of stuff. The quest for the perfect sunburst, things like that. Well, I am a fan of the ancient guitars. I I do like ancient guitars, but I think I may be one of the rare people who likes them both. I think mm. uh, modern guitars can be equally good, or I think it's actually better. I think there are people who can build on. These were these were factory production guitars, and even modern guitars, who, who, which then and still I think has a standard of precision that is greater than at least any of its peers at that time. I think there are more modern production companies that meet that same standard. But I think individual luthiers can look at the details of guitar and they can fine tune it, tap tune it, so they can take the basic designs. Um, they can build brand new modern structures of their own fantasies, which is fantastic, and I have some of those. Or they can replicate, in a sense or be inspired by the vintage guitars. And you're holding a guitar by a fellow who is simply one of my favorites on the planet who does oh, yeah. this, Dale Fairbanks. Um, 
He is actually in, I live in Connecticut, the state adjacent to New York State. Dale lives maybe an hour from me. Uh, frequently, Dale borrows my guitars for months on a time. I loan them to Luthiers. To to use the, the, absolutely, absolutely. And he's used, had this guitar and many of my other guitars. Um, he is a guy who I really think can tune in to sort of that dry fundamental sound of particularly old Gibsons. He can mm. emulate other guitars, but he's really good at the Gibson sound. But then improve on it, modernize it, and he's really, really great on that. And I know you're, whole, you're, you're a dealer, I think, for Dale, is that right? Yes, absolutely. We're very proud to represent him here in Europe, and uh, this is his 1942 uh, version of the, uh, uh, the J45, he calls it his F45. Right, and if you'll notice, that is actually a replica, or replica with improvements, literally, of mm -hmm. one of the, actually the best J45 I ever played in my life, uh, and it's the same guitar that's on this cover. And you can tell that because it's one of the rare J45s that had a fire stripe pick guard. Fire stripe pick guard and the inch bridge. And... Right. And Dale had that guitar in his hands for a while. I loaned it to wow. him, but it wasn't mine. Very cool. Uh, Dale and I are actually uh, involved in, oh, I think it's just a, a wonderful project. And um, I'm hoping to see one of those guitars over here for you. Yeah. But he's going to make 25 copies of, uh, I have, so I'm, I'm a lucky man having discovered these World War II guitars. I have two. This one actually went to World War II. It bears the battle scars, literally, from <laughs> World War II. The first purchaser was a soldier who bought it new in 1945, 1943, excuse me, took it to the European battlefront. And on his death, his grandson contacted a dealer who then contacted me and said, John, you have to have this guitar. And I actually married the loveliest woman in the world. She said, John, you have to have that guitar. So, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, who am I to turn that down? <laughs> but I also have a minty one. I have one that looks just brand new. And uh, I loaned that to Dale for a long time. And uh, same model, same year, uh, but looks brand new. And Dale is going to make replicas of that guitar. The labels are now already um, done by a fabulous uh, graphic artist in the U.S. And they are signed by one of the two surviving women in that picture. In addition, we've gotten woods uh, that came out of the Gibson factory in World War II. I got a chunk of maple. Mm through my various contacts in Michigan that somebody took home in the, either the early to mid 40s, so right around World War II, and we're gonna use that chunk of maple to do two things. One is to create these banners on the guitars, and the second is uh, to create a wooden label inside. Beautiful. Oh, no, we have a paper label, excuse me, to create these for bridge plates. Uh, oh, so the actual heart of the guitar is going to be... The heart of the guitar will be World War II maple that, would, that these women's hands would have touched. Uh, what I get out of it is, is no money. Uh, well, maybe you can talk <laughs> about that. But, but, but Dale has agreed to contribute some money toward a fund to produce a plaque in honor of the Kalamazoo gals that will go on our old Gibson building, which is still in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Gibson's not there. Um, the current owners have said they're, they're in for this. There's a renovation project, so there will be a permanent monument. Uh, in addition, there will be 25 of these guitars made with all these incredible uh, bits of history and by a great, great maker, great mm. young maker who really knows how to build like this but has a skill. This is a production production instrument. This is actually one of the, the best examples of that. Of course, these are factory instruments. Mm. The workers never had any particular training, although when the women came by, they got literally no training. I asked the women, what kind of training did you get? They always said none. Well, how did you learn? Well, I sat down and they told me just to do what she's doing. And this guitar, uh, all your viewers will know this, but an X-Brace, it's an X-Brace guitar, and the X-Brace usually obviously crosses in the middle. This one doesn't. It crosses about an inch to the base side, right. almost an inch. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, so that, let's say, let's say uh, two centimeters. Just feel where the, the inside is. It's way off center. Oh, wow. And, and it's actually rotated a little bit. And That's, so uh, yeah, you can, I, I, can, I can figure out, <laughs> figure out how this happened. They, someone told this woman, you just cross the expiration, you glue it in there. No one said put it in the middle. So it really ends up with a very sweet, it's, it's a different tone than the other one I have. Mm -hmm. And I think the bass is a little less emphasized and the trebles are a little clearer. By moving it to the bass side, it actually stabilizes the bass a little more, opens up the treble side, maybe a little more, or maybe it's just because sat in foxhole mud for, for, for a long time. Um, but it probably made a difference. But, but you know, th those, those are production workers and there are a lot of quirks in it. There are no quirks in a Dale Fairbanks guitar. Dale tunes everything. Um, so I'm excited absolutely. about this project. Yeah, absolutely, as, uh, as are we. Well, fantastic. John, thank you so much for joining us. This is, uh, it's been absolutely fascinating, as ever. Uh, Kalamazoo Girls is available 
Now uh, through your website, I and, believe. Or Amazon. Amazon's and a good Amazon place. And Amazon as well. Right, okay. We know where to go. It's a, it's a wonderful and, um, and actually very moving read. Uh, right, and a special deal. If you buy one between now and the end of 2016, you have a pick of any guitar here for free. <laughs> right, Michael? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> that's simply not true. Thank you, John. Thank you very much to my, you for watching. My pleasure. And I got some great <laughs> guitars to go play. <laughs>